Thanks. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. So my, my theme for tonight is uh, taking back software engineering craftsmanship is not enough. Um, what I want to talk about is um, certainly, certainly in the spheres that I've moved in for the last few years, uh, the, the, the term software engineering has, has, has not really had a good name. I, I, I've, for, for many years, I used to be called things like a software engineer during the early parts of my career. And then through much of this century, that's kind of become a little bit unfashionable. It, it, it's a soft thinking about software engineering is, has, has not been appealing. And I can understand the reasons for that. I think there are good reasons for that, which we'll, some of which we'll talk about. And the craftsmanship movement has come up. And I, I don't think there's anything evil about the craftsmanship moment, movement. I think that craft is important, but I think it's not enough. And I want to try and make the point and talk a little bit about what that is. I think in recent years, uh, the, last, uh, the last decade, uh, maybe the last 15 years, we've started learning some things about software development that we didn't really know before, at least we didn't apply regularly before. And that has made a step change in capability in terms of being able to deliver software more effectively at higher quality. Uh, and that's in part, when I think about it, because we're applying more engineering style thinking to the development of software. So that's my thesis. That's what I want to talk about this evening. I think when we think about engineering, often we think about things like this. And this is to software engineering what a soldering iron is to electrical engineering. They're not the same thing. This is not engineering. Uh, this is a tool. It may be useful in, 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 in applying some engineering or it may not. It's a tool, but it certainly not, doesn't define what software engineering should be. Uh, we might think about the processes that behind our software development. We can think about uh, Scrum uh, and th those sorts of uh, management processes. Hands up, a anybody, any idea how many times the documentation, the guide for Scrum, man mentions the words software or code? Show, show your finger how many times, tens, fifties? It is zero. It mentions it zero times. Scrum is a very good project management discipline that is equally applicable to plumbing as it is to software development. It says nothing really about software development on its own. Without the engineering disciplines that we need to apply to add on to it, it's not an engineering discipline. <coughs> In recent years, craftsmanship as, as an idea, software, software craftsmanship has gained ground. And uh, apart from the kind of the sexism inherent in the name, uh, that, that's, that's a different argument, which I'm not going to go into. I, I, I think this too is not enough. This is not engineering either. Uh, craftsmanship is not the same as engineering, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail of what I mean by that. I think an interesting way of thinking about this is to think about uh, the, the history of, of human production. And... <laughs> This is probably a gross simplification, but, but at least at the level of my gross simplification, I think that there are three levels of, of the production of things that, that humanity has, has seen. For much of human history, everything that we created was the result of a craft-based process. Everything was hand-built. It was, it was down to the, you know, the, the work of a, a individual artisans and the, the quality was, was very variable. We then moved on to the, the era of mass production about 150 years ago was the first instances of mass production where we started making things more reliably. And then at the end of the Second World War, Edwards Deming went to Japan to try, because the Americans weren't listening to him to try help revive the Japanese economy. Uh, and and the, the, the thoughts that he kind of started off grew and developed into the Toyota process and, 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 and the lean movement. And, and so lean production techniques has, has kind of taken over the world in, 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 in high tech production, certainly, but in, in production across the board, really. Let's look at each of those in a little bit more detail. So the history of production, is craft, uh, the history of production for craft, is craft based is kind of art rather than science. It's about the individual skills of, uh, of an individual, of, of a person. There are no work standards. It depends on the, the quality of work of, of, of a person. Each per piece of work is unique. It's handcrafted, uh, that's kind of what it means. And it's based on ex individual expertise, so the, the quality is extremely variable. Um, I think 
that on the whole we have a fairly romantic view of what craft, craftsmanship is. We, we, we think of it as being a nice thing. It's, it's, you know, if, you, if you buy a very posh car you might have hand-stitched leather seats or something like that. But on the whole, um, craftsmanship is characterised by being low quality. Yes. Uh, imagine for a moment, just to paint the picture of what I'm talking about, imagine a handcrafted iPhone. <laughs> It's a nonsense. It makes no sense at all, the idea of something like that being crafted. You know, that's not possible even as a prototype without engineering. <coughs> the history of mass production is a little bit older than we think. We tend to think, of it, uh, uh, we think, we think about assembly lines and Henry Ford building, building cars and so on. The first real mass production was unfortunately uh, production of armaments in, in, the, in the Civil War in America. And there's, there's a nice story if you can have nice stories about building uh, things to kill people but there's a, a story about the man who wanted to try and get the contract to supply the northern states in the American Civil War with their rifles and he went to Congress with a bag of components and tipped them out on the floor of Congress and asked the congressman to select the different components from which he assembled a rifle that was the first time when there was such standardization of components to allow for that, and so he won the contract as a result. I th somebody told me that he was cheating when he, when, when he did that. that he'd, but be, prior to that, each, each gun, each rifle, would have been hand-built by an, a, a craftsman of some kind. And certainly in previous wars, even to the extent that you were given a mould for the bullets for your gun, if you, you broke your gun, you took it back to the person that had built it in, originally very often. So these were individual things. The standardization revolutionized the ability to, in this case, wage warfare. Then later on, Henry Ford came along and came up with assembly lines and so on. And, and let's, be, let's be clear, mass production is a big step on in terms of the, the ability to, to repeatedly produce quality artifacts. Mass production is about assembly lines, standardized components, standardized steps in, in, in the, 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 the process of creating things. Piece-based metrics, we measure the, 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 the progress of a mass production process by how many components we've created. And then we move on to lean production. Lean production kind of, um, you know, is, is, is about this, this, this focus on quality. Quality at source, build quality into the things that we're creating. It's about pull-based systems. If you think about uh, mass production systems, you're building components and effectively you're kind of pushing them down the line. You build components until you've got enough components to be able to build your rifle or your car or your aeroplane, whatever, whatever it is. For lean production, that's more like a pull-based process. Uh, we, we, we have in ideas like just-in-time delivery, just-in-time manufacture, just-in-time warehousing. We're going to pull the things just at the moment when we need them and we're going to try and keep the whole process lean and efficient as a result. We're going to minimise the amount of work in progress. We're going to focus on minimising waste in the, in the system. And we, there are ideas like one-piece flow that come into play in lean-based manufacturing. So where does, where, you know, where does this apply? Uh, what, what do these things mean? One of the, one of the disciplines that is kind of uh, fairly rigorous in looking at processes and uh, uh, approaches to solving problems is chemical engineering by the nature of the job of chemical engineers who are trying to industrialize a production process for building some uh, material of some kind um, they, they're very interested in the nature of different processes and they have a taxonomy for process control and, and here's one of the process control models that they talk about the defined process control model requires that every piece of work be completely understood Given a well-defined set of inputs, the same outputs are generated every time. A defined process can be started and allowed to run until completion with the same results every time. So the first thing that I would say about that sounds nothing like any software development that you've ever seen in your life. Um, the play, this kind of approaches that play in this world are mass production assembly lines and waterfall processes. This is one of the reasons why waterfall processes are such a terrible fit for software development. It's because they assume that everything's kind of a cookie cutter, a production process. The chemical engineers have, have, have another process control model that's kind of interesting. It's called the empirical process control model. The empirical model of process control provides an exercise of control through the frequent inspection and adaption for processes that are imperfectly defined and generate unrepeatable and unpredictable outputs. 
To me, that sounds an awful lot more like what my life feels like when I'm writing software. That feels much closer to the sorts of problems that we day to day try to solve. This is the territory of craft-based production, exploration, continual improvement, and lean process. One of the reasons, I think, that the idea of software, software craftsmanship has, has, be, has, has gained such ground and has such appeal is because it is a significantly better fit than a waterfall-style process. And in reaction to the waterfall processes that we kind of mistakenly employed through the 1980s and 1990s, we, we, we kind of reacted against that. That's when, the, that's when the idea of software engineering started to get a dirt, you know, a, a, be a bad name. And so we came up with the idea of, of, of craftsmanship. And I, I, you know, I, that's a better solution. It's a better fit for the kind of process that we're talking about. But I don't think it's good enough. I think that what we should be aiming for is much closer to a genuine lean process. So where is the software industry right now? So I, I think it's not anywhere near mass production. And I think it never will be. And I think if it was, it would be a disaster. It's the wrong type of model. I think this is where software development is. We see this in the variability of, uh, of quality. We see this, we, we, we talk in our industry about 10x developers who produce much more and the teams that, 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 that do this kind of thing. It's very variable. It's down to the individual skills of, in, uh, of people. We don't really leverage uh, learning and the skills across our industry and produce things more consistently. But I think that's what we should be aiming for. I think we should be aiming for something more in this territory. If software projects were normal things, there ought to be a normal distribution of software project success, as many software projects ought to finish ahead of schedule, under budget, delighting their users, as finish behind schedule, over budget, and annoying their users. But I don't think that that's what we recognise as normal for our industry. I think that what we recognise as normal looks much more like that that has quite serious implications. It colours the way that we think about establishing new projects. It colours the way in which we, we, we create teams. It colours the way that projects are funded, that, that, they, that they are commissioned, that they are tested, um, requirements are set. All of these things are built on this assumption of failure. It means that we make all sorts of assumptions about what's normal for a software project and I think that what we're really looking at is what's normal for a software project where we've got the model wrong. A normal distribution is exactly that. It ought to be normal. If we got the model right for software development, the distribution would be normal. When we do get it right, we see some quite startling changes in the performance of software development. We see things like 21% less time spent on unplanned work for teams that adopt these kinds of, these kind of more uh, genuine approaches. 44% more time spent on developing new work rather than fixing defects. 8,000 times faster deployments. Eight times more frequent production deployments. 50% less time spent on f security issues. 50% lower change failure rates. All of these kinds of numbers, they're, they're quite surprising when you look at them. The other thing that's kind of interesting, which is slightly, slightly I mean, you know, off the wall, it's slightly, slightly, slightly different, is, is this. This is the, the BBC News report of the Volkswagen engineer who was recently jailed. He was sent to jail for uh, 40 months uh, as a result of cheating the emissions uh, in the Volkswagen uh, engine management system. So he wrote code that detected when the Volkswagen was, a Volkswagen was under test conditions and changed the performance of the engine under those so that it would give more favourable emission uh, results. Uh, as a result, he went to jail. That's the first time that that's happened, as far as I'm aware, uh, that somebody's been held responsible for making an engineering decision. If, if this man had been an engineer, a qualified engineer, he would have had courses in ethics. He would have taken those when he went to, when he went to university. He would have um, been held culpable. He could, in many countries around the world, he could have been barred from being an engineer in the future as a result of making this kind of choice. That's kind of what professions look like. 
I think that thinking in terms of ethics is also an important part. I'm not going to talk much more about that. I'm going to talk more about the engineering thing, but I think that's an interesting, an interesting um, uh, uh, side view to think about, to, to, to add into the, in, into, the, into the conversation. So, I particularly like this little GIF animation which shows two different views of the solar system, the, the, the orbits of the planets in the solar system. And I like it because it's a great analogy for, for talking about paradigm shifts. On the right hand side we've got the view of the solar system that humanity held for thousands of years. It assumed that the Earth was at the centre of the solar system and that everything in the sky revolved around the Earth. And that makes perfect sense when you look at the stars, which all revolve around the Earth quite nicely, but it makes no sense at all when you look at the orbits of the planets. They make all of these screwy kind of patterns. Sometimes this, the, the planets will go backwards in the sky because of, the, because of what we're looking at. If we live in this solar system, then we can't extrapolate and Newton can't come along and come up with an inverse square law. It doesn't make any sense. An inverse square law doesn't describe what's going on here. Um, a few centuries later, Einstein can't come along with bendy sheets of space-time and general relativity. That doesn't flow from this model either. So getting the model right is really important. A few centuries later, Copernicus came along and came up with it and said, no, no, we've got it wrong. The sun's at the centre of the solar system. He got in big trouble with that with, from, from various religious organisations. But it simplified the model. It meant that Newton could come along. It meant that Einstein could come along. It meant that we could extrapolate. It meant that even I can do the math to work out where the planets are. That stuff's important. As I said, I like this as an analogy for, um, for, for paradigm shift. What we're talk I, I think that much of the software industry is essentially operates in this world. It sees software development as an enormously complicated thing and it adds complexity on complexity to try and achieve, achieve its ends and that's a mistake. If you pair away what software development is really about, it's actually relatively simple. And by adopting some what I think of as an engineering discipline around some of this stuff, it improves our ability to do that. One of the things that's kind of a bit strange when you get a bunch of software to develop developers together and start talking about engineering is we all seem to immediately start talking about bridge building. How many times have you heard a software developer say, well, software development's not bridge building? <laughs> I've heard people say that quite a lot. Uh, and, and it's true, it's not bridge building, but then on the whole our view of what bridge building is isn't, bridge, isn't, isn't what we think it is either. Engineering is not all the same. Uh, it's bridge building is not the same as other forms of engineering. Um, we can look at discipline, you know, house building, uh, aerospace engineering, electrical engineering, chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, um, uh, civil engineering, chemical engineering, all of these disciplines are diff subtly different from one another. They, have, they share some common principles, but they're different. Then again, engineering is not the same at different scales. If you look at these two buildings, it's quite evident these are both, first, these are both engineered structures. If this was a I don't know, do you have IKEA in Singapore? Yeah. <laughs> so if this was an IKEA shed, you can guarantee that it's engineered to be as cheap as possible and you know, to, 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 to be able to assemble easily. You can guarantee that it would be engineered to do that. This thing, the tallest building in the world, is going to be engineering on a different scale. They'll have, going to, they'll have done wind tunnel testing, finite element analysis, all sorts of things to figure out how to do that. They'll have built models of it, they'll have done computer simulations, all of that kind of stuff in this engineering. It's obvious when we look at this that the engineering involved in that thing is entirely different to the engineering that we look at this thing. However, when we talk about software, it's not quite so obvious. If I talk to somebody that doesn't understand anything about software and describe the software behind my mother's cake shop and compare that to the software behind an air, air sp uh, aeroplane control system or um, medical scanning device or um, high frequency trading system, then it's not going to be obvious that there's a big difference between those. But there is. There's the level of engineering that we apply is not necessarily the n necessary at every scale. But there are still commonalities. There are still common themes that ought to be consistent across whatever the nature of the software that we're, that we're undertaking. 
I've been talking kind of peripherally about engineering for a couple of years now. Um, and occasionally people will tweet things to me or send me messages. And this is a, t a tweet that I was sent by somebody. I've hidden their name because I really strongly disagree with what they say here. And I don't want to, dis I don't want to disrespect the person that sent me the message. But what, he, what this person said was, for me, engineering means working in a certified, inflexible process that includes planning ahead a lot the antithesis of Agile. I'm sorry, but I think that's nonsense. I think that's a complete misunderstanding of what engineering is about. That's confusing production for engineering. In most physical things, production is a difficult problem. It's, if you're building aeroplanes, the design of the aeroplane is complex, that's engineering. The design of the bridge is complex, that's engineering. But also the production of the thing is complicated too. The repetition of being able to do that. So that's, but it's, for us, production is or should be trivially simple. We push a button, it builds our software, it's done. That's production. Our problem is different. Our problem is all design. Our problem is all about discovery and creation. And so that's the kind of engineering I'm talking about. That's the analogy that we're talking about. That's nothing like this. So this isn't describing engineering either. So let's look at some definitions and see if we can kind of pull some words out that help us understand what we're talking about. This is from Wikipedia. And it says it's about the application of empirical evidence, scientific, economic, and practical knowledge to invent, innovate, design, and maintain, blah, 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 blah. Structures, tools, systems, components, interesting stuff. Here's another one. Uh, this is from dictionary.com. The art or science of making practical application of the knowledge of pure sciences um, to practical things. Uh, another one, the application of scientific and math mathematical principles to practical ends. Uh, efficient and economical structures, again. Processes and systems, again. There's some common themes in here. So here's my working definition. Here's, here's what I, when we're talking about engineering, here's what's going through my head. Engineering is the application of an empirical, scientific approach to finding efficient solutions to practical problems. I think that's a decent working definition that we, that we can apply and think, wouldn't it be nice if software development was like that? One of the commonalities of, the, the, one of, the commonalities of engineering is the, 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 the incremental approach to doing things. And that applies across the board to solving complicated problems. I am, I am old and grumpy enough to be able to, to start saying things like, I don't believe that humanity solves any hard problem without doing it stepwise, piece by piece. You don't build anything complicated before first building something simple. That's where you start. The Shard is a fascinating building. This is a, this is a relatively new building on the London skyline. I come from England. I, I live about 50 miles away from this building. Um, and the Shard was really interesting in the way that it's created. Mostly, when you build a huge building like that, what you do is that you build massive foundations and then you build the, the, the building on top of it. That's not how they did this. What they did was that they built just enough foundations going down and then just a bit of the building going up and then a bit more foundations and a bit more building and a bit more foundations and a bit more building and a bit more foundations and a bit more building. And as a result, they dramatically cost the cost of building this very tall building on the London skyline. Well, they started off simply and explored, extrapolated. For me, when I start thinking about what engineering really means, particularly in the context of software development, it boils down to these five things. We want our approach, whatever that might be, to be iterative. We want it to employ feedback so that we can learn, adapt, reflect on what we're doing and change what we're doing. We want it to be incremental. We want it to be experimental. We want to try out ideas, evaluate ideas, and learn when we're wrong and when we're right and move on on the basis of that. And we want it to be empirical. We want to be using real world discovery, not just based on theoretical models. So let's explore each of those ideas in a little bit more depth. Here's a definition from Wikipedia again. Uh, whoops, sorry, sorry. Iteration is the act of repeating a process either to generate an unbounded sequence of outcomes, not very interesting, or with the aim of approaching a desired goal, target or result. That's the bit that we're interested in. So. Being iterative is really important. It means that we can learn, we can react and we can adapt based on what we learn. 
it means that we can steer towards a goal. We can, we can understand what's going on. We can navigate our route through the complexity of, of the understanding and, and learning. And we can navigate to some destination. We can target an, an outcome. We can refine our, our, our approach. We can improve continually uh, the, 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 the quality of our work. And because of that repetition, it allows us to get better and better and better until we're really, really good at the things that matter. So iteration is really important. It's vital. In fact, it's central to the, to the approach, really, to be able to do these sorts of things. Feedback. Feedback is information about actions returned to the source of the actions. That's a bit of a dry definition. Feedback means that we can insert, observe the impact of our choices. We want to be able to set up our approach to doing things so that we can reflect on it again and steer again and learn again. We can get, gain feedback. Feed, this is my model for continuous delivery. This is a model of feedback. And this is a, simpli a simplified picture, a schematic of what continuous delivery is about. At the outside of these feedback loops is, is the, the, feed, the crucial feedback loop of software development. We want to have an idea, we want to get that idea into the hands of our users, and we want to figure out what our users make of the idea. That's pretty much what all of software development is for. At the inside, we've got the really fast, short feedback cycle of test-driven development. We want to write a test, see it fail, write some code to make it pass, tidy it all up, check it in, move on. And in between, we've got executable specifications, and we want to get feedback from there, too. We want to be incremental. As well as being, as well as being iterative, we want to be incremental. Incremental is about evolutionary design, continuous design, evolutive design, or incremental design. is directly related to any modular design application for which components can be freely substituted if someone improved can ensure better performance. That's a, an important part of software development. Iterative and incremental are different things, different aspects of, of an approach. And interesting, I'm, I'm a bit of a, I'm a, bit of a, a space nerd, uh, and, and, um, and, and the Apollo missions are a great example of modularity. Uh, this was an extremely modular system. Uh, this is the Saturn V, uh, and that bit, is about getting from the Earth to Earth orbit. Oops, sorry. Just that bit. Earth to Earth orbit. This bit is from Earth orbit to Earth. This bit is from Earth to the Moon and from the Moon back to Earth again. That's the service module, that's the command module. Um, this bit is about the bit from the Moon so the lunar module, that's the lunar descent module that took us, the, the astronauts down to the moon. That's the lunar ascent module. It took them back up to orbit into in, in lunar orbit. And this wasn't obvious at first. The, the first ideas that the NASA engineers had were kind of 1950s spaceship. You know, you had a space rocket on the ground. It took off. It flew to the moon. It landed on the moon. And it took off from the moon. And it landed all the way back. That's enormously inefficient. Exactly. Yeah. It also meant that they could kind of subcontract this to different organizations. This was, what, you know, this is, this is a massive challenge for the American um, arms industry and, and industri aerospace uh, industry to be able to just build all this stuff. There was, it was, they were breaking new ground, so they were able to farm it out to different subcontractors. Um, um, Northrop, Grumman, all of these, all of these people built, built little bits of the system. It also meant you could compose the spacecraft in different ways. Depending on which phase of the mission, you'd organize these things in different points. During the takeoff, the lunar module was in a, was in a bay buried beneath the service module and the command module. Um, during, the, uh, during the journey from the Earth to the Moon, it was all configured like this. From the, from the, from the Moon to the Earth, it, was, it lost the, the, the descent module bit. So you could configure the system in different ways and use it in different ways. That was remarkably useful when Apollo 13 happened and the disaster happened and they had to use this thing as a lifeboat. All the systems here cra crashed. The, 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 there was no life support left in this, this part of the spacecraft and they flew home basically in here. This is a composable system. <clears throat> the other part that's interesting about incremental systems is, is about the units of change and the effect that that has on risk. Uh, so one of the key ideas of lean thinking is to reduce batch size. 
when we talk about software, what that means is minimising the number of changes. So we can think about change in different ways. So we could make many, uh, uh, many changes and kind of deploy them all together. That's kind of one level of risk. And we could make many small changes and deploy them independently. That's another level of risk. Let's try and just come up with a, it's a bit of rubbish maths, but uh, let's come up with some maths to try and describe the kind of formula that you might think of for that. So the total risk associated with releasing some software is the risk um, of, 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 some, of, the, of there being uh, a, an error in, in, in a change, there's a problem. And that's going to be, the total risk is going to be dependent on the number of changes, the sum of all of the risks for a change. But that's not all. There's another level of risk. There's the risk that one change might interact with another. And that's going to be an exponential part of the function because as you have more changes, the likelihood of those things interacting in nasty ways is more likely. So you're going to have something like the risk of interaction and that's going to be a power function of some kind. So in this formula for total risk, n is a significant number. The number of changes is significant. So if we decide to do this, to have lots of, lots of changes, then n is very large. So risk is very high. If we do this instead, if we make many small changes, each one simpler, each, each, one, each, one, each one more, more, more composed, each one much more straightforward, then n is very small. And so the total risk is low. So this, working in an incremental way, is also a way of de-risking the problem. The last thing on this is the words are a bit similar. So what's the difference between iterative and incremental? And um, I, uh, I'm stealing somebody's work here. So this is a picture that was in Jeff Patton's wonderful book on story mapping, which I think is the best description that I've ever seen of the difference between iterative and incremental. This is working iter iteratively. We're going to start off with a fully formed version at some level resolution of detail, and then we're going to fill in detail. Incremental is different. Incremental is about doing it in pieces, in modules. And if for an engineering discipline, we need both of these things. We need to be able to do sketches of the, of the system and, and do that and then be able to, be able to realise those, fill those out. But we also want to make composable systems that we can add to and bolt new features on and, and enhance in that way too. We want to be experimental. So some more Wikipedia definitions. An experiment is a procedure carried out to support, refute or validate a hypothesis. Experiments provide insight into cause and effect, demonstrating what outcome occurs when a particular factor is manipulated. I want to tell you another little story based on, based on the space program. So in 1961, John F. Kennedy, American president, stood up and said to Congress, uh, we're going to send men to the moon and bring them back by the end of the decade. And all of the people in NASA went, <gasps> because they had no idea how to do that. They were nowhere near being able to do that. It was a million miles away. That was an outrageous statement at that point. At that point in history, um, John, uh, 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 Alan Shepard had been the first American into space about two weeks before um, uh, uh, Kennedy stood up in Congress. So Alan Shepard was an enormously brave man. He was strapped on top of a redstone uh, booster, which, at which point those, those rockets were blowing up all of the time. Uh, he was in a capsule. He was fired 60 miles up into, up into, up into space and then parachuted back down in, in, in the Mercury capsule. Enormously brave, but incredibly, incredibly risky what he did. And that's, what, that, that's all they'd done so far. This was the time when their spaceships were blowing up all of the time on the pads. They hadn't got reliable launch vehicles. So Kennedy's just kind of put this flag, you know, in the, we're going to do this. <laughs> Not my problem. You sort it out, NASA. <laughs> you know, uh, well, I was talking to somebody recently who said this is probably the most expensive user story ever written. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very big user story. So here are the things that NASA didn't have a clue how to do uh, at this point, which is basically all of the things that you need to be able to do. <laughs> 
So they hadn't really got launches sorted. They were, they were very hit and miss la launching spaceships. They hadn't done multi-stage vehicles yet. And they, they kind of got the splashdown sorted with, uh, um, uh, with Alan Shepard, but it was a bit hit and miss. Gross Grissom sank his capsule on the second one. Um, they, they hadn't got flight, pla uh, the flight control systems really worked out. Nobody had yet done a spacewalk, Russians or Americans. Nobody had yet docked two spacecraft together. Um, all of these things were, were just kind of out there. So when you're faced with a challenge like that, where on earth do you start? I think that uh, we, we, we tend to think of, of, of NASA being very procedural, but you know, here's the problem. Here's, 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 here's the problem. Here's the Earth-Moon system. And this is, this is where they're going to start from. Actually, I'm cheating. This is a kid's storybook picture of the Earth-Moon system, not the Earth-Moon system at all. This is what the Earth-Moon system looks like. This is a, this is a scale uh, drawing. At this point in human history, no human artifact had been more than one pixel away from the Earth. First problem, how do you get from there all the way over here? You can kind of imagine the conversation in NASA the next day. Uh, uh, <laughs> what are we going to do now? <laughs> I know, I've got a good idea. I know, let's, let's build the spaceship, put three astronauts in it, send it to the moon and see if they come back. <laughs> yeah. oh, maybe not. That's maybe not the best plan. Uh, let's build the spaceship, send it to the moon and, uh, without the astronauts and see if it comes back on its own. No, let's not, not, not do that. I know, let's build a spaceship and just send it to the moon. Hold on a minute. That simplifies things quite a lot. That's almost halves the problem. Bringing it back is really hard. <laughs> so, okay, let's send a, let's spend a, send a spaceship to the moon. What does landing on the moon mean? Well, it doesn't have to survive the landing. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what this was. This was the Ranger program. These were literally spaceships as bullets fired to see if you could hit the moon. <laughs> this was the program. The first Ranger mission was to put a Ranger spacecraft in orbit around the Earth. Blew up on the pad. <clears throat> the second Ranger mission was to put a Ranger spacecraft in orbit around the Earth. Blew up on the pad. <laughs> this, if you've ever worked on a big project, the next step might amuse you. So, they've just had two failures. Yeah, but we're behind schedule. Let's go for the moon. <laughs> <laughs> The third one, it got into Earth orbit. It, 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 did, it did Earth orbit. They did the deorbit burn uh, and missed the moon. The fourth one, it got into Earth orbit. As it left, it did the deorbit burn, headed off for the moon, uh, and all of the systems on the spaceship packed up. They managed to track it from Earth based stations and they watched it hit the moon. So, they, so that's, that's, that's progress of a kind. <laughs> the fifth one, missed the moon again. <laughs> The sixth one, it got, into, it, it got into Earth orbit. They did the deorbit burn. The cameras packed up, but they got telemetry. They, it, it went, it hit the moon, they got the data, but they hadn't got any pictures. The seventh one worked, the eighth one worked, the ninth one worked. So, you're NASA in the Cold War. You've essentially been given a blank check. You know, the president said, you know, this is, the, you know, this, we're going we're gonna to beat the Russians to the moon. You, you're going to do this. You can recruit anybody from the Western world, any brains that to help you. What do you do? You start experimenting. That's how you do hard things. You start experimenting. You don't come up with a plan and say, that's what we're going to do on day one. You break it down into small pieces. There were millions more experiments than I've just described to get to just this stage. You start experimenting. That's how you do anything hard. So let's just think about being experimental for a minute. Have people seen this before? The idea is, is that you're supposed to figure out which is, the, which is the bigger orange dot. Can I have a show of hands for people that think that this orange dot is the biggest? That's my perception. Okay. And a show of hands that people that think this orange dot is the biggest. A show of hands for people that think that they're both the same. Right. So we could carry out an experiment. Measure. They are both the same. Have people seen this one before? So this is about which of these lines is longer. Hands up for people who think this line is longer. That's my perception again. Okay. Hands up for people that think this line is longer. Nobody. Hands up that, for people that think they're both the same. Probably both the same. Okay. 
you weren't paying attention, you have to do the experiment. Yeah. This line is longer, I cheated. <laughs> <laughs> that really is longer. <laughs> And so you can't, we can't tell until we do the experiment, until we measure things, until we gather data, until we figure these things out, we can't really know. We want to be empirical. Empirical, the definition of that, based on, concerned with, or verifiable by observation or experience, rather than theory and pure logic. We often talk about maths. Being, being, being very close to software development. And in some ways it is. Uh, software development kind of aligns quite nicely. I, I think it appeals to the same kind of brains that like maths, they tend to like software development. There's, there's an appeal there. But it's not enough. Maths isn't enough. We've tried really hard to write provable systems. And you can write provable systems. You can, you can, write, you can have languages that are provable. They're incredibly hard to write. They're incredibly difficult. So hard that you create bugs in them because it's so hard to understand what it is that you wrote. So we want to be empirical, we want to be able to try things out, we want to see what works and see what doesn't. Being empirical is important because it means that we can evidence-based, we can try stuff out and we can start separating the myths from the truths. We can start, we can start doing science, we can start being more rational about the choices that we make. So, here are my five different properties of an engineering discipline, an engineering discipline that I think software development ought to be. Actually, I'd be interested in seeing how continuous delivery, my personal favorite approach to software development, stacks up against this model. Well, it's incredibly iterative. It's about establishing these, these short cycles that allow us to adapt and learn and figure out what ha uh, happens. It's grounded in the application of feedback. The deployment pipeline is a feedback mechanism. That's what it's for. Uh, being able to automate the system, the testing, the evaluation, the deployment of the system, the monitoring of the system in production is all about trying to get feedback from production back into development so we can learn and understand what it is that we're building. It's incremental. <clears throat> it tends to push us towards more modular systems because they're more easily testable, they're more, they're more easily evalu evaluatable, and that helps us make more composable systems. It's experimental. The, again, the deployment platform is a, the king of, of, of experimental platforms that allows us to evaluate what it is that we've done and how it is that it works. And it's empirical. It allows us to measure things and, and understand what really works. Continuous delivery is an engineering discipline, to my mind. It's about these short feedback cycles, test-driven development, automation, hypothesis-driven, test as a falsification mechanism. We think about these things, these are scientific, rational approaches to solving hard problems. And when we do this, we get the kind of results that I was talking about before. We get ridiculous improvements in the quality of our software. Orders of magnitude drops in bug rates in production are, is common for organisations that practice this kind of discipline. Um, the ability to create software more quickly, to, to get it into production and understand what lands and what doesn't land, what works and what doesn't work. These are the ideas that are behind some of the most successful software companies in the world. This is how Amazon works, this is how Google works, this is how Facebook works, this is how Spotify works, Netflix. These are effective companies. It's how Volvo Trucks works. It's about how NASA built the software for the Curiosity rover. <coughs> Fundamentally, we're trying to do this. We're trying to make an observation. We're trying to make a theory based on what we observe. We're trying to make a prediction from the theory and we're trying to create an experiment to validate our predictions. That's what we'd like to be able to do. What we've learned over the years, if we want to do, do any sort of do, uh, software development, is that we know, everybody in this room knows, that you don't do these as separate stages. That doesn't work very well. So these are continuous activities for all of us, all of the time. We're doing these things. We're doing design, development, test, releasing all of the time. That's what works best. And what we do then is that we iterate around this approach to develop our software. This is a measure of cycle time. This is the time that it takes us from idea to working software in production. That's a useful measure to understand how efficient our process is. But what this gives us as a platform when we approach software development this way, it allows us to have our theory, make a prediction, carry out an experiment and, and observe the results. It allows, in production, it allows us to have a theory, make a prediction, 
experiments inside a test environment and observe results. I think this is a genuine engineering discipline. I think this gives us, this leverages our capability to create higher quality code. And when we do that, we see the results. We see that we saw that changes in orders of magnitude changes in the performance of our capabilities. That's my talk. That's why I think we should be taking back software engineering as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an idea. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions, thoughts, discussions. Well done. Thank you. Take uh, a, few, a few questions. Uh, it's, this isn't so much a question as a statement. Um, you're es essentially preaching to the converted here. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, personally, um, because I see software engineering as an engineering discipline, that is why I am a member of professional engineering societies because I believe in software engineering, I believe in software engineering professionalism. Um, and I think that it is the responsibility of people who want to call themselves software engineers to be, engineers. as you, as, your, as you uh, mentioned in your side note, uh, professionals and to follow good engineering practice. And in fact, the unfortunately named uh, extreme programming, which is not really that extreme, is, like in your illustration there, a good example of engineering practice. Yep. So what, what is so alien to engineering as having standards like coding standards and testing things to ensure that they work? So, so I, 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 th I think it goes a little bit beyond some of those things. So, so first, I would agree, you, agree with you that I think XP is an engineering discipline too. Uh, and I think I'm, I'm, I'm one of the people that's coined... The term continuous delivery predates the work that Jez and I did, but I think that we described it to mean this kind of process of, of, of refinement and reflection. But I think of continuous delivery, it's kind of like the, the child or the grandchild of, of extreme programming. It's, it's extreme programming just with the, with the scope extended a little bit. It's the same ideas. And I think that is an engineering discipline. The thing that I think is really important, so, 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 so this, for me this goes quite deeply, so mostly my recent career has been writing software in kind of technically demanding regimes, I've worked in uh, low latency finance and building exchanges and those sorts of things. These days I consult for people that are building mass spectrometers and hospital oh. scanners and stuff like that. So it's kind of interestingly technical stuff. And I think that when you're, when you're, when you're talking about that, lever, you know, building software, that's kind of getting toward, more towards the hyperclear building kind of engineering rather than the, the, the shed. Uh, and so we take this stuff fairly seriously. Uh, I think that test-driven development and acceptance test-driven development and high levels of automation are crucial to being... I think, I think of that as part of the discipline of engineering. I think that the, the, the things that we tend to... The things that the in software industry as a whole have tended to pick up from Agile are the easy things to adopt rather than the hard things to adopt. And you've got to do the, the, you've got to do the hard things, you've got to do the engineering stuff. I think, I think that the idea of software development as a profession is a, is a really nice one and we've kind of missed the boat. I would point out that I don't qualify to be a member of the British Computer Society because I don't have a degree. Um, there are other routes to membership. <laughs> um, um, I'd like to contribute your rigor. Just <laughs> go back to your sure. rubbish mat slide. This one? You know, your rubbish mat slide, the one with the sigma. Uh, the risk. The risk. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> you call it the rubbish mat slide. No, rubbish mat slide, yeah, yeah. you don't like it. Uh, 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 being in the community, I like to contribute to the community. Yeah, yeah. So, let me uh, contribute a bit more of the rubbish mats. There we go. Yeah, if you go to your formula, uh, RC subscript N, not plus, go pi, product of RI subscript N. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then you get your R to N. Yeah, okay. But, uh, R to N, and then for the other slide, the sub slide, where yeah. you have N is smaller, it's not quite true, it's N times M, where M is the number of modules. Uh, oh, so I'm, I'm talking about the number of changes, so... Yeah. So N in, in one big change, that's perfectly accurate. Yeah. If you go down to the next slide, yeah. where you have this 
smaller number of modules. Yeah. You have M modules and N in each M module. Mm. You do have an N times M product in there. Yeah, so, so I, 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 I think you can still think of this as changes rather than modules. I think that's a separate. I think that's a separate because conversation. Because there is module interaction. Yeah, 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 maybe. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the for the. I'm a math geek. <laughs> yeah. uh, you mentioned something. You don't have a degree, so you can't be a member of a professional uh, organization. Uh, uh, one thing which is interesting between uh, okay, one thing we know is that education versus uh, uh, work. Yeah. And uh, and. Uh, so we know that, uh, that uh, fresh graduates, computer science or, or, or engineering, uh, software engineering graduates, usually they're not considered like uh, ready to go yep. uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a real environment. And that's part of the reason why like, okay, something is not working, we don't like engineering approach. Yeah. I guess unlike mechanical engineering. Yeah. So uh, uh, in craftsmanship, we, we have this different uh, idea of uh, how learning is done. Uh, but you didn't talk at all about the uh, learning part. What is your opinion about <coughs> this part of craftsmanship? I, 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 th I, th I think there are two bits of that that I'd like I'd like to address. So, so first, I, I think that what you're talking about is kind of the the, the, the mentoring approach. The, 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 um, Fred Brooks talked about kind of the surgeon approach, where you had a surgeon and you, you know, had a consultant surgeon, and, the, and he was followed around by interns who learnt from the surgeon and saw what was going on. And I think that's I think that's a good model for for, for imparting our, our, our learning, our understanding of software development. I, I've been involved in those kinds of programs throughout my career, really. Uh, as a technical leader uh, in organizations. The other part of it, I think that one of the reasons why, from my point of view, we teach it so badly uh, is because we, we, we don't constrain enough. We don't say what's in and what's out. And I think that we should. I, I, for example, I, I, I'm a hardline test-driven development person. I believe that when a kindergarten child learns to write their first line of code, they should do that in the context of writing a test first. I think that test-driven development is that fundamental. Test-driven de development is like double-entry bookkeeping for, for, for the equivalent of double-entry bookkeeping for software. You wouldn't hire an accountant who didn't do double-entry bookkeeping because they would be incompetent. I don't think you should hire a software developer that doesn't do test-driven development on the same basis. Software is too fragile. It's intensely fragile stuff, and unless you've got some level of verification which test-driven development gives you, you don't know whether it's doing what you intend it to do. There's a, there was an academic study this year, which I can't find the reference for at the moment, um, which, which, which uh, analysed production failures, and they estimated that 79% of production defects would not occur if people practice test-driven development. It eliminates the simple things that we all get wrong all of the time. And so it's important. I don't think that we should teach software development without learning how to do that. I don't think that we should be, you know, we should be learning how to be incremental. We should be learning how to be experimental. There should be stuff on the scientific method in every computer science course. Nobody that I've talked to in the UK or America does that. I don't, I don't know what Singapore education is like, but nowhere in the UK or, or in America, none of, the, none of those uh, computer science programs include science. But, but one of the things that I think you would say from the craftsmanship model that is a valuable trait to apply to software development is the idea of the apprenticeship type model. Oh, absolute, absolutely. Where people are learning in practice yes. from people with expertise. And that's a fundamental thing from, from craftsmanship yes. which that should apply. Yes, I, it's I, not, there's, it's not there's, just about process. There's, there's not much that I disagree with. with I, I think that craft is important, it's just not sufficient. In addition to craft, you need engineering to get more repeatability, more reliability in the process of creating software. It's still an intensively creative process. Oh, it's still, you know, it's still going to, it's still going, you know, a matter of invention. Every time that we write some code, we're inventing. Yeah. I was commenting that I disagree that test-driven development is the the most important thing as you have put forward. For me, I think the most important thing, aside from the scientific method, which I think underlies the entire methodology. Yes. I think the most important thing to me is the teaching of communication, the user's first methodology in the Agile Manifesto. Uh, it's because software engineers are too focused on the engineering, are too focused on the process, are too focused on the math, and not focused enough about asking what do the users actually want.
I, I would, I would, I would disagree. Uh, I mostly yeah. agree with what you said. I would disagree with the idea that software developers are too focused on the engineering. They're too focused on the tech. Yeah. They're too focused, too, fo too focused on the toys, um, not the engineering. And, and not focused <laughs> enough on the communication. Yeah. I, I, soft, for me, software development is all about problem solving. Yes. I care much less which programming language that I use as much as I care about the way in which I divide up a problem and represent it. Uh, I don't, you know, the, the, the programming language is secondary in, in terms of that kind of stuff. And yet we, 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 we're constantly kind of blinded by the flashbulbs of, of, of new shiny tech. Focus on building the right thing rather than yes. building the thing absolutely. right. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Any more thoughts, contributions? Probably the last question. Last question. No? Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you.